sorry, Javis. Thank you so much for your courage and your um, ability to tell that story and to uh, you know start Vida and go so far in just a couple of years. It's, it's really an incredible journey, and I'm so honored to have been even a little part of it by being your friend. So we're going to um, have um, the next part of our briefing, um, Kathleen McDonald. And Kathleen is the Education Prevention Coordinator with the Gail um, Schoenbach Freed Foundation. Kathleen and I met in 2002 at a congressional briefing for the EDC. And um, Kathleen and I were both speakers that day. And I was telling the story of my daughter's death from anorexia. And Kathleen was telling her story about um, her battle with anorexia and her frustration with getting access to the care she needed um, covered by her insurance company. Um, since that day, Kathleen and I have been very, very close friends and shared lots of laughter and lots of tears and lots of celebrations together. Um, Kathleen is also the policy uh, assistant with the Eating Disorders Coalition and gives countless hours to our organization. It's been just an amazing um, um, help to all of us at the EDC. So Kathleen today is going to talk about patient advocacy, a lifeline for those trying to access eating disorder treatment, something that's very dear to her heart and all of ours. Thanks, Senator Harkin, for allowing today's briefing. Um, special thanks to the staff and the EDC both. For um, for caring enough and having the insight enough to include a grant program for patient advocates in the Freed Act. This is in the bill because of Senator Harkin's staff um, bringing it to us, which many of you heard about this morning. It brings literal tears to my eyes to know that this is a component of the bill. The Free Act's language is relatively simple, as bills go, um, yet this simple language will lead to something so very powerful, especially for all of those who just raised their voices here today. The bill simply reads this, the secretary, acting through the director, shall award grants under this section to develop and support patient advocacy work to help individuals with eating disorders obtain adequate health care and insurance coverage. That's pretty darn good. I mean, just imagine. Imagine if we were coming here and telling victory stories and that people with eating disorders will have help once the freedom passes, obtaining the coverage they need and we no longer hear stories like you shared. I have the privilege of serving as a patient advocate here in D.C. for those affected by eating disorders. I also serve as one for those throughout the country. It is one of the most difficult things I have ever done in my life. As a patient advocate, I help individuals and their loved ones who need assistance muddling through an emotionally and mentally exhausting maze of circumstances to simply receive both proper treatment and coverage for their treatment of their eating disorder. And while I have the privilege of assisting individuals and families affected by eating disorders, the privilege often comes with a very heavy price. Because as a patient advocate, especially for people with eating disorders, you are often the one who the insurance company sides with or not. You are the one who the, eating, the emergency room doctor listens to or not. When the insurance company sides with you, my god, that's, like, that's a really good day. And you go out and you celebrate. But when the insurance company doesn't side with you and says she's not sick enough to warrant inpatient care, but will authorize two outpatient visits to a therapist, okay? It's a very grim day to make to your patient, to make that call to your patient. And when the emergency room tells you to sit and wait, sit and wait it out because we don't treat eating disorders after you brought your client to an emergency room in the nation's capital, mind you, because she took Adderall in an effort to lose weight. If she is having chest pain and is so dizzy she can't hold up her head, she can't stop vomiting, and she is sweating through her second pair of clothing that afternoon. She's paler than any person you've ever seen. 
and you're told to sit and wait it out, that's a very grim day. So I just want to see a quick answer, a show of hands right now from people in the audience who have been affected by eating disorders, whether or not you're the sufferer or you're the caregiver or the loved one, who have had trouble negotiating with their insurance company. Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, who did? Raise your hand. <laughs> now I'd like to see a show of hands of those who have ever gone themselves or with a loved one to a hospital emergency room and had the emergency doc doctor look at them, shrug their shoulders, and say something along the lines of, eating disorders don't really have that serious or life-threatening consequences. Call your therapist in the morning and make an appointment. Raise your hand. Now I'd just like to know, how many of you had a patient advocate with you, aside from me? No any of my folks are here. No hands went up in the room. Now imagine <clears throat> that you're Leslie George's mom and dad, Sally and Ron, and Sally, Leslie's mom, receives a call from her. Leslie's in a mall parking lot. She has just binged, and she is unable to purge. Her stomach hurt with a pain worse than she had ever felt in her life, she tells her mom. So, Sally tells Leslie to call 911, and Leslie does. She arrives at a Northern Virginia hospital, and the doctors begin aggressively treating her, thinking it might be her appendix or an ovarian cyst. After talking with her mom and dad, Leslie decides to tell the doctors that she suffers with bulimia, that she has just binged, and that is when the stomach pain started after she binged. After Leslie discloses this information, the doctors stop treatment. They withdraw all medical care and they tell Leslie, who is luckily frightened out of her mind because of the pain, to quote unquote, go home and deal with the consequences of your behavior. A little while later, Leslie is in septic shock and her vitals are plummeting. Doctors arrange for her to be flown to a different Virginia hospital where they perform surgery to now try and save her life. The pain that Leslie was telling the doctors about was that her stomach had ruptured. As her mother sat by her hospital bed, Leslie told her repeatedly, I know I'm going to die. After spending nearly $200,000 on efforts to save Les Leslie's life in her sh after her stomach had already ruptured and septic shock had set in, Leslie died on September 29, 2000. She was only 19 years old. Medical personnel did not take her eating disorder seriously. In fact, they punished her for it. What if Sally and Ron had had access to a patient advocate that night? I just want you to pause and consider what might have been different. The Georges not only had to grieve the loss of their precious baby girl, Leslie, but they also had to grieve that they are the ones who advocated for their daughter to tell the doctors that she had an eating disorder. Had they had a patient advocate, I firmly believe that Leslie would not have suffered in the way that she did. An advocate could have ensured the doctors that to take Leslie's bulimia seriously. An advocate could have urged the doctors to pump her stomach rather than stopping all treatment. An advocate may have advised Leslie's mom and dad to make sure that Leslie did not disclose that she had bulimia because doctors are so undereducated about what that means. And just perhaps, if Leslie had had a patient advocate, I believe that her mom and dad would not have buried their daughter 10 years ago yesterday. Imagine you are Carrie, and then in April of 2004, you are seen by a mental health counselor. You disclose that you have bulimia. But even though Carrie was purging, her counselor diagnosed her with non-purging type bulimia because Carrie was not purging frequently enough in this counselor's own handwriting and quote unquote to warrant a diagnosis of bulimia. She was authorized by her insurance company to visits. The counselor who was not trained in patient advocacy for insurance coverage of eating disorders knew of Carrie's excessive weight loss, her purging, and her excessive exercise. The counselor did not know that it was possible to advocate for more aggressive and comp comprehensive treatment. Carrie, only seven months later, was rushed to the emergency room after, after aspirating a foreign object while she was purging. The object was removed from her esophagus and she was sent home that night. On the discharge papers, it read, and I quote, it is the medical social worker's assessment that the patient could be discharged safely. 
Carrie's journal states that she so desperately wanted help but felt that she didn't deserve it based on previous calls to her insurance company and then the ER visit. So as so many people with eating disorders do, Carrie held out hope that she would finally be made, a treatment would finally be made available to her if she only purged more, if she only got sicker, and if she only lost more weight. Carrie called her insurance company on April 13th of 2005 and she asked for help for her eating disorder. She stated on that phone call, I am battling with an eating disorder. And this is all quotes from her insurance transcripts. I have them. I'm battling with an eating disorder. I am depressed. I am unable to focus. I have difficulty functioning. I am failing all my college classes. And I am isolating myself to eat. The insurance company authorized Carrie two days of partial hospitalization in a facility that does not treat eating disorders. On April 14th, the day after she made that phone call, Carrie was admitted to the partial program not treating eating disorders. Carrie was described on her intake report as such. Depression and eating disorder over the past two years, history of binging and purging, worsening of mood, more hopeless, helpless, with increasing depressive symptoms, she is increasingly tired and she is fatigued and she is purging and her bulimic behavior includes laxative abuse. She is also failing her college courses due to lack of concentration. That's on her intake. The patient also reports having dysphoria, problems with sleep, feelings of worthlessness and guilt, loss of energy and fatigue. It is also noted on Carrie's intake that Carrie stated the following. On April 14, 2005, I feel downhearted and blue. I feel sad. I feel tired. I feel like a worthless person. I feel like my mind is working too slowly. <sighs> Carrie's insurance company discharged her from all treatment 11 days later. Her discharge assessment 11 days later read that Carrie, or states that Carrie said the following, I have thoughts about death and dying. <clears throat> I am critical of myself, my weaknesses, and my mistakes. Things seem so bad, I feel like giving up. I feel like a failure. I don't feel very hopeful about the future. On that same discharge summary, it was noted that Carrie claims recent severe wish to die. And Carrie showed improvement while in our program, and she was improved in discharge condition. So I just, I, I'm very confused. I don't hear an improved condition in 11 days between her intake and her discharge. Why did her insurance company make the decision to discharge Carrie? She was still thinking about death and dying the very day they let her walk out the door. Due to constant phone calls and pleadings from Carrie's mother, on May 3rd, 2005, Carrie's case was finally reviewed by the insurance company again. This is nearly a month later, and this is also two years into her struggle where she has been asking for help since nearly day one. Carrie's case was reviewed, but they determined that she did not meet the medical necessity criteria for treatment. How many of you have heard that before? Mm -hmm. This was determined despite the fact that no blood work had ever been done on Carrie while she was in the partial hospitalization program. She was still underweight, she was purging, she was depressed and hopeless. As it states on her insurance paperwork, however, which took her parents four long years to obtain after Leslie, or sorry, after Carrie died, her insurance company said further treatment is not necessary or authorized. Three weeks after her discharge, due to her quote unquote improved condition, Carrie died in her sleep. On May 20th of 2005, her autopsy indicated that Carrie had been in a potentially reversible heart failure. Her autopsy also stated that she died from quote unquote, normal complications of anorexia. I would just like to tell all of you here who are not familiar with the eating disorder field, there's nothing normal about dying from an eating disorder. She was 21 years old and she had suffered with bulimia and anorexia for only two years. What if Carrie and her mom had had access to a patient advocate who knew how to talk to insurance companies about the APA guidelines for care? What if they had a patient advocate with them in the night at the ER when Carrie had aspirated for an object? I want you to consider what might have been different. If there had been a patient advocate, I firmly believe that Carrie would not have suffered. 
I believe that the doctors would not have dismissed Carrie's anorexia, bulimia, and depression as not serious and life-threatening. If there had been a patient advocate, I believe that Carrie's insurance company would not have had the audacity to authorize discharge after she stated that she had a severe wish to die. If she had had a patient advocate, I also believe that Carrie's mom would not have had the burden of trying to care for her family, all the while trying to negotiate treatment for her dying daughter. If they had had a patient advocate, I also believe that she would not have been the one trying to convince the insurance company that she was sick enough. As a result of not having a patient, as, and as a result of having a patient advocate, I firmly believe that her mom, Shelley, would not have had to bury her daughter on May 20th, 2005, just six days after her 21st birthday. And finally, I want to tell you about Nicole and Boyce. She drove herself on one of the snowiest days we've seen here in D.C. from Pennsylvania to be here to hear about the FREED Act. She wanted to be present for the official introduction of it because she had herself had suffered for countless years with anorexia and bulimia. Though Nicole and I had communicated via email for a while, this was the first time we met in person. It was February 25th, 2009, the day the FREED Act was introduced in the House. What a smile she had. Despite the tears running down her face from the pain that she was in, you could see happiness in her eyes because the Freed Act had been introduced in the house. She had hope. And I remember most her smile that day from meeting her. The second most important thing that I remember from meeting her that day was the insanity which she relayed to me about her insurance company denying her treatment. It was one of the most absurd situations I had ever heard. Here she was, having had open heart surgery because of the complications from her eating disorder, and her insurance company was saying no when she called to beg them for treatment. It was because Nicole had already been in treatment once that they denied her further treatment. So I became Nikki's insurance advocate, and I even tried to get her into a heart clinic rather than an eating disorder clinic, something, anything, to try and keep her alive because she wanted to be alive. Her insurance company still said no because Nikki weighed too much. I was livid. What more did she have to endure before they granted her treatment? That is stigma at its worst. I remember getting an email from Nicole after her visit to DC of April of 2009. She had ended up in Georgetown Hospital that night with chest pains and she wrote to tell me about her visit and how she was since. She said, mentally I'm feeling the strongest I felt in ages, but physically I feel the worst. I am still having heart problems and additional problems with all of my cell counts, red, white, and platelets. My anemia is severe enough that it is either transfusions or tri IV iron infusions. So I am doing them weekly for now. I have been taking my laptop along with me and working on the Freed Act letters, our letter writing campaigns, while I wait for four hours of infusion. I'm at kind of a rough spot, I suppose. I'm not doing as well as I should, but I've continued to lose weight since my inpatient treatment in 2008. It was all good at first, but now it's costly in many ways. I just have to keep holding my head up and believing that it will get better soon and that I can do this. Yeah, poor ER treatment. That's I've had that. I've had many experiences, but perhaps the most standout was when I went to the e emergency room in Georgetown Hospital, ironically, just after lobby day. I was lucky I made it out alive. The doctors knew nothing about eating disorders. What if Nicole had had access to a patient advocate who worked on her case full time and who had access to the laws of Medicaid and Medicare in Pennsylvania? Someone, what I mean full time, is somebody to make those calls and sit on hold for 30 minutes while you're waiting for somebody to take your call, pleading to get a case manager for Nicole. What if she had that? What if Nicole had a patient advocate when she went to the emergency room here in the nation's capital? What if Nicole had had a patient advocate who was funded by a federal grant that gave clout to the advocate instead of when the advocate would say, well, if Nicole dies, this will be on your head. Are you willing to accept that? <coughs> And what if Nicole had had a patient advocate the night she went to the hospital for chest pain on April 22nd of 2010? 
Would the emergency room doctor have prescribed her fentanyl? Or would Nicole's patient advocate have said, no way? Do you know what that could do to somebody whose heart is already compromised because of her eating disorder? Don't you know that fentanyl could kill her? And you, wait, you want to combine that with oxycodone because she's in pain? Are you kidding me? No. I want you to consider it might have been different had she had a patient advocate. I consider that if Nicole had had a patient advocate, she would not have died in her sleep just one night before she was supposed, supposed to leave here to be here on the hill lobbying by our side for the FREED Act last April 27th, 2010. If she had had an advocate, Nicole's family would not have had to bury their beloved Nikki at age 28 on April 30th, 2010. It was just three days after she was supposed to be here like you. Can you imagine if every cancer patient's family was up here sharing these stories? I can't. You know, or if they were told, come back in six months when your tumor is bigger, or we'll authorize two visits, two sessions of chemotherapy, okay? And good luck getting better on your own. A patient advocate counsels and assists individuals and their family by presenting their rights and their options. And they often intervene and they fight to ensure that the patient is being properly cared for and can focus on their recovery rather than on their insurance company we're trying to educate the doctors about what tests they need run. That would be just novel. I have had clients who, while they're in treatment, have gotten phone calls from their insurance company, not from their family, from their insurance company. Currently, there are no legal requirements, however, um, to demand the certain qualifications to be a patient advocate. But with the FREED Act, we will do that. We will develop a training program to specifically address the issues that often arise when suffering from and seeking treatment. I have had great success sometimes when I'm advocating for my clients at, at the ERs and telling the doctors what type of tests to run. I have had great success pulling a doctor aside and saying that comment that you just made about you don't look like you have anorexia, you're not really that thin. That's inappropriate. <coughs> really why when we get into a conversation, patient advocacy not only works, but it saves lives and it educates. This is definitely one of the hardest speeches I've ever had to write, and it took a while for me to simply begin writing it. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of stories, and you could have all probably included some in this speech to share today. But I was finally able to begin writing after I read two emails that I received recently, and the first is from Carrie's mom. She said, Kathleen, Carrie died the day her first appointment with another therapist was scheduled. During that time period that we waited for approval from the insurance company, Carrie told me she was afraid she was going to end up like Terry Schiavo. Carrie cried for letting me down. I cannot put into words the impact of losing her. So I'm choosing to let you share Carrie's very private experience to promote awareness and talk about this very serious and misunderstood illness. She was my best friend. She dreamed of being a nurse and a mom. I wish you could have met her and I'm with you today when you give this speech. This is from Nikki's mom. I could not be more proud of you than if you were my own daughter. You knew as much about Nikki's journey as anyone. No one could be more proud of you in the Eating Disorders Coalition than I am. I am so very honored to have you work on her, Nikki's strongest and most important projects of her life before she passed away. You will never ever know how proud I am of everyone who is fighting there today. So very hard for such an honorable cause and all the lives that the Freed Act will save. I'd like to really just close with um, a message for any of you who are Senate staff and have eating disorders in your portfolio. I wholeheartedly believe that if you go back to your boss and your office and tell them about the insanity that you have just heard, as we have all spoken, and also the hope the insanity that those who are suffering with eating disorders face when they try to get treatment and the frustration that parents face when told your son, and son or daughter is just not sick enough to warrant treatment, I believe that your boss will sign on to the FREED Act as soon as possible. I will continue serving as a patient advocate until FREED passes. I will continue to miss Nicole. My dear friend, our dear friend, 
who should not be immortalized on a piece of paper and just a memory to us. She should have had access to appropriate care. We will pass this bill for her and for all the others who suffer and don't know how to advocate for themselves yet. Thank you so much.